Hey, good morning. How are you guys? Good, good to see you. Welcome to the bridge here at Asbury. I'm Jeremiah, I'm the Modern Worship Director here, and I just wanted to welcome you guys, especially those of you viewing online. We're so glad that you're with us. Um, Man, I hope you guys have had a great week. I've had a little hectic week. I think Robert told you guys a couple weeks ago, my wife and I were expecting, and we're no longer expecting because he's arrived. Um, So we had our baby boy on the 30th. Yeah. So this is the group project we were working on. And, you know, I saw this quote that was pretty funny about, like, group projects uh, or pregnancy is like a group project that one person works on. Anybody ever been in class like that? One person works on the whole thing. That's pretty much what happened. But this is our group project. So this is little Liam. And he's awesome. So he must have been pooping here or something. So you get a cute smile. Um, dude's got some pipes on him. Let me tell you what. So he might he might be a singer like his dad. Um, and that'll be cool. But um, yeah, we just, we love, love the little guy. He's so cool. Um, and I promise I did not leave my wife at home alone. <laughs> uh, someone asked that. They were like, so you're here. Who's, who's with mom? So my parents moved in with us, uh, which is fantastic. My dad's actually here uh, today. But So my mom is back with her. So she's not alone. I didn't do that to her. That would be just the worst thing. So I didn't do that. But, um, you know, we talk a lot at Asbury about... Um, that all of us have value, all of us have something to give. And, you know, having a kid this week um, just, like, really hit me in a, in a totally different way. And you, you dads, you are aware of this. Um, but just gives you new perspective. And you think about, like, all the times in the Bible that um, talks about God is in this parenting language, right? Um I was thinking about Jesus talking to people. It's in, I think, Matthew 7. And he's like, hey, you, you dads, like, your, your son will ask you for, for bread. You're not going to give him a rock. If he asks for this, you're not going to give him something bad. You're evil, but just, like, think about, like, so, <laughs> just like, hey, dads, you're doing great. You know stuff. You're evil. God's not. So, like, think about even even how much better the gifts that God wants to give his kids and um, so I think let's reflect on that this morning as we get going. That like God really desperately wants to give us good gifts. Um, and so let's be open to receive them. I stumbled on this quote too. Let's throw this up there. So this is from Pope John Paul II. It says, nobody is so poor that he has nothing to give. And nobody is so rich he has nothing to receive. Um, hmm, been an emotional week. I'll catch up. Um, so let's pray together. If you're comfortable with it, often we'll pray with our hands open to receive. So let's pray together as we begin. God, thank you for how you love us, how you care for us. Meet us here today. Fill us with your presence. Help us be the people that you always dreamed we'd be so that we can be people that are moved with compassion, moved with love for our communities, for people who don't know you yet, for people who are struggling. Fill us today, we pray. Amen.
breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in all in wonder the king of glory the king above all
sky With eyes fixed on the one who knows no end You stand strong for all the time In the joy, in the trial You are the beginning and the end Your love goes on Your love goes on Forever open wide You stand strong for all the time In the joy, in the trial You are the beginning and the end Your love goes on Your love goes on
family, there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are in a common relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord. Good morning. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 1 through 10. I think we'll have that up on the screen in just a moment. The Lord was attentive to Sarah, just as he had said. And the Lord carried out just what he had promised her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham when he was old, at the very time God had told him. Abraham named his son, the one Sarah bore him, Isaac. Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, just as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has given me laughter. Everyone who hears about it will laugh with me. She said, who could have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse sons? But now I've given birth to a son when he was old. The boy grew and stopped nursing. On the day he stopped nursing, Abraham prepared a huge banquet. Sarah saw that Hagar's son, Sarah saw Hagar's son laughing, the one Hagar, the Egyptian, had born to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, 
send this servant away with her son. The servant's son won't share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. This is the word of God for the people of God. And the people respond, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And before I start, I want to thank you so much for your patience as you host a guest preacher. And, uh, and I want to thank perhaps the most committed worship leader, Jeremiah, for being here immediately after the birth of his son. Congrats to Jeremiah and Mia. <clears throat> Uh, My name is Caitlin Harper. I'm the pastor at Community Church Without Walls. That's a United Methodist mission congregation over in Birmingham's West End. West End is one of Birmingham's low-income communities, and I'll be subbing in for Robert Mercer today. As a preacher myself, I think it's awesome to have guest preachers every once in a while, because if they do really well, then you kind of get credit for having recruited like a good guest preacher. And then if they don't, then you get to go back to your preacher and tell him how much you appreciate him and how much you appreciate his particular preaching style. You can tell him how thankful you are for him. It's it's great to get substitute preachers. I'm really glad to be with y'all today. My own congregation meets in the afternoon, so every now and then I can kind of sub in and help a friend who needs a substitute preacher. Uh, But what you really need to know about worship at Community Church Without Walls is that it is less formal even than this. It happens outside and and there is is no fancy sound equipment, Um, but most of all, Church Without Walls worships according to black church traditions. And that means that any time I preach a sermon, I have a lot of help. I have a lot of help from the congregation. There's a lot of verbal feedback, a lot of back and forth. It is, as Jeremiah alluded to, a group project. It's a group project. So I am commissioning you today to preach with me. We are going to walk through our assignment together. I have Robert's email right here, and we'll figure out where to go. I'm counting on you to give verbal feedback throughout this sermon so we can preach this together. And this is biblical, by the way. Like, look at all the letters in the New Testament. Like, if you look at the book of Romans, Paul is not writing just to Unia or Andronicus. He's writing to the whole church to work it out together. And by the way, if you hate this, you can just go back to Robert and take him to lunch and be like, you will not believe what your guest preacher had us do. It'll be a bonding moment. It'll be great. You're welcome. (laughs) So let's look at our preaching assignment for this morning. I've got Robert's email right here, and we've all got our Bibles or smartphones, as it were, Uh, and we trust the Spirit. So let's find ourselves a sermon. Well, first of all, today's the 4th of July, and when you're preaching, as we all are today, you have to mention the 4th of July. If you don't, it will outshine whatever sermon you are trying to preach. The 4th of July is huge. It's not in the lectionary, it's not in the Bible, but it's big, right? It's big. It can't just be the elephant of the room. You got to say something about the 4th of July. But that's okay. There's a lot of cool stuff we can do in church with the 4th of July. There's lots of biblical themes about freedom and citizenship and the limits of nationalism. There's all kind of fun we can have in church on the 4th of July. So far, so good. This is going to be great. Let's keep reading from Robert. And we're doing a sermon series. I love those. Do you love sermon series? It's about women of faith. All right, let's workshop this thing. Women of faith and the 4th of July. What do you got for me? I heard a (laughs) woo-woo. Where are we taking this sermon? We've got a Venn diagram of the 4th of July and women of faith. We got to get right in the middle. What, What do we have? What's that? Freedom? What's that? One more time. Free Britney, ooh, that is its own sermon. I will sit down right 
now. Now, I gotta admit, I, I get a little stuck there too. Like when I first read this email, I was like, all right, we had this good freedom trajectory going, but we gotta put women front and center too. Okay, that's a lot to do. You know, what exactly does the 4th of July have to say to and about women? Because when you think back to the 4th of July, 1776, you know, that commemorates the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created equal. Okay, all right. Um, you know, and they couldn't really vote at the time, and, you know, they didn't have property rights or a whole lot of other rights. So much for our freedom sermon. You know, that was really good. I'm sad to let go of that. It might be a little more complicated now. But I believe in you, and I believe in the Spirit. We can make this work. Anybody got anything else for me? Free Brittany, that was great. Susan B. Anthony, Susan B. Anthony I like that. Founding mothers. Beautiful. Okay, y'all chew on it. I'll keep reading. Okay, okay, Sarah. Sarah is who we've got today. Not just all women of faith, but Sarah. Okay, we trust the Spirit here. We can do something with Sarah. What do we know about Sarah? Search your vacation Bible school brain or your disciple Bible study notes. Somebody tell me anything you know about Sarah in the Bible. I'm hearing murmurings, but I, I need... I need loud. She's what? She was barren. She was barren. For a long time. Yes, not for just a minute. A long time. You are saying things and I can't hear them. She was old. She was super old. Okay, great. The sermon is coming together. <laughs> she was really old. America. Awesome. Now, what, what else? Tell me more about Sarah. She laughed. God made a promise to her that she would have a child, and she laughed. Ugh, that's not great. <laughs> okay, what else can we do with Sarah? What else do we know? She traveled with Abraham. Yeah, Abraham had to leave his land, his homeland. She traveled with Abraham. Yeah, there's also this, this bizarre story. Do y'all remember this? So there's this moment where after Sarah has this promised son, Isaac, where Abraham takes Isaac up on a mountain. Do you remember this? At, at God's instructing to do what to Isaac? To sacrifice him, to kill him. Okay, and where is Sarah? Where is Sarah? <laughs> Holy smokes. She's not even in that story. And there's an old Jewish tradition called Midrash. Midrash just means filling in the gaps in Scripture where Scripture doesn't tell you the answer. So Scripture doesn't say, and meanwhile, Sarah was wherever Sarah was. It does not tell us where Sarah was or what she thought about what was going on while Isaac is traipsing up a mountain to his apparent death. We don't know. But knowing what we do know about the context and about the story, where do you imagine Sarah was? The kitchen. Mm. That stings a little. But what do we know about women in this context? You don't have to be a biblical historian, you know. What kind of power do women have in this context? I heard none. None is a good answer. Yeah, not, not that much. Okay, so Sarah's really old. She traveled with Abraham. <laughs> She doesn't have a lot of power. Mm. I imagine, and again, this is midrash. This is not what scripture says. Scripture is silent about this. But I imagine that Sarah is as clueless about what's happening to Isaac as Isaac is. I imagine that she is not in on the scheme between God and Abraham, at least not at that juncture. That she and Isaac have both been kept in the dark. So we've got Sarah, mother of a nation, really old, laughs at God. What do all these pieces mean? Man, when y'all take Robert to lunch next week, 
you, you ought to have some questions for him about how all of this adds up and comes together and what it has to do with America and the 4th of July. But friends, there is another part of Sarah's story that I hesitate to even tell you. Do you remember, and not everybody grew up in church, but if you did, do you remember the character Hagar? Do you remember her? Who is Hagar? Sarah's slave, Sarah's slave. And where is Hagar from? Egypt, she's from Egypt, that's right, that's right. Okay, uh, so Egypt is on the continent of Africa. We have this woman, Sarah, to be the mother of a nation. And we have a woman abducted from Africa to be her slave. What in the critical race theory is going on here? This is insane. Like, is anyone else getting queasy right now as we step into this territory? We're supposed to be talking about American freedom today, and instead, we've been assigned to talk about a woman who owned a slave. Something about that makes me nervous, but you know, you have to go with it because when the Spirit moves you, even if it moves you in an uncomfortable way, you can't just quit there. You gotta see where it takes you. All right, so Sarah is a woman in the ancient world, doesn't have a lot of power, but enough power to have a slave, and she has this slave, Hagar. And what happens between Sarah and Hagar? Does anybody remember? Yes, oh, y'all. Oh, y'all, she commands Hagar to be her surrogate, to gestate a baby and do Sarah's laboring on her behalf. Y'all, is this the Bible or is this an episode of Handmaid's Tale? This is gruesome. This is gruesome stuff. And it says that Sarah deals harshly with Hagar. And at one point she treats her so badly that Hagar runs away just into the wilderness, right? Like not back to her family. She's far away, just into the desert. And later, Sarah exiles her, sends her into the desert with her little kid and a small bag of rations to basically die in the sun. Can somebody call Robert? I mean, like right now, I think we need to take him to lunch immediately. Do, do I have this right, sisters and brothers, that you and I have been tasked to stand in the house of God and ask ourselves what a harsh slave-holding ancestor of our faith has to say about the fourth of July. I can't speak for any of you, but until we get Robert on the phone, let's just pause. Friends, these are the hazards of taking scripture seriously and reading it well. You will not only see the people of God and all of their unsugar-coated realness, but you will often see yourself and your family and your nation, and if you do it right, it'll often make you so uncomfortable. It can sometimes really knock you for a loop. Now, I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that you can conflate American slavery and biblical slavery. They are just not the same thing. But they don't have to be for there to be a powerful symbol in there. Did anybody else grow up singing, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So Abraham, we, we sing that Abraham is our father not because we can trace our biological lineage back to him, at least I can't. If you can, kudos, I cannot. But because he is sort of a founding father of our faith, he's our spiritual ancestor, and so if Abraham is a founding father, that makes Sarah, his wife, a founding mother. She's our spiritual ancestor. We are her descendants, the heirs to her faith. But the Bible doesn't shy away from her flaws. It makes us face 
exactly who she is and exactly what she does. It's so important to be clear-eyed about our ancestors. I mean, we can thank God for them, appreciate them, and even love them without deifying them, right? I mean, just because they did some amazing things doesn't mean they didn't also do some kind of troubling things. I would like to be able to tell you that the story in the Bible of Sarah and Hagar just sort of fizzles out here, that the narrator just kind of clears their throat and moves on with Isaac's lineage. But there's actually another kind of huge wrinkle in the story that we have to deal with, and it has to do with what happens to Hagar in the wilderness. So remember, she runs away, to, or she, she's in the wilderness twice. She runs away the first time, the second time she's exiled. But both times, when she is in the wilderness, somebody meets her there. Did anybody, anybody catch this or anybody already know? She meets God. She encounters God in the wilderness both times times. And the first time the Bible gives us this little extra detail, it's like one verse, and then it just moves on like nothing happened. You could miss this. But here's what it says. It says that Hagar gives God a new name, El Roy, which means God of my seeing or God who sees. And then she says, how can I survive having seen God? Now, in the Bible, seeing God is kind of a big deal. It's huge. I mean, do you remember when Moses wanted to see God? Moses wants to see God, and God says, no, you you can't do that because you will die if you look at me. So here's what we'll do. You stand on this rock, and I'll pass by, and you can sort of look at my back. That's, That's what you get, Moses. And this is Moses the liberator of the Hebrew people, the bringer of the law. This is your biggest Old Testament celebrity. And he gets to see God's back. (laughs) All right, Moses. But Hagar, on the other hand, Hagar is supposed to be nobody. She's a woman. She's a slave. And soon, she will be a homeless desert wanderer. But she gets to see God. I bring this up to point out that God does not appear to Sarah either of those times. Just Hagar. I had a a colleague of mine tell me once that whenever you put up a wall and cast somebody out, that God is always on the other side of that wall. Y'all, there's, there's a racial reckoning going on in our country right now, and, and we can all feel it. You don't have to keep the news on 24-7 to know it's in the air. It's a hot button topic like never before. This week, the debate is about critical race theory and who knows what next week will bring. But the fact is, it's a conversation that's not going anywhere. And as the people of God, it is our responsibility to face it without flinching. People you know, your neighbors, your coworkers, students at school if you're a student, are looking to you for truth and wisdom about this and everything else, but you gotta be prepared. Don't look away, even though it's a topic that hurts. So one thing Sarah and I have in common is that we are both mothers. Are there other mothers in the room? Yes, I thought there were one or two. For those of you who, uh, who aren't mothers, I don't know if you've heard this, but gestating and birthing a child are hard. They are difficult. In fact, for many of us, they are intensely painful. I don't know if word is out about this, but it is the case for many of us that it is very hard to birth a child. <clears throat> I'm not about to subject you to any of my birthing stories right now. I'm not doing that to you today. But I will tell you something that I think is relevant to what we are talking about today. 
At one point in the birth of my first child, I just despaired. Y'all, I was lost in the pain and gripped by fear. I was undone. But I had this amazing doula who was coaching me through it. And I'll never forget one thing she said to me. She said, stay on top of it, Caitlin. Stay on top of it. And I can't tell you why that made sense to me. All I know is I did. I stayed on top of it. I focused in. I recovered myself. I stayed on top of the pain. And my baby was born. When we, as Christians, start wrestling with the reality of race in America, it will be hard. And for many of us, it will be intensely painful. Stay on top of it, y'all. Do not despair. Do not lose yourself. There is not even time to feel guilty. I release you from that. Let it all go. There is too much good work to do to waste time on guilt and shame. And remember, God still used Sarah. I've been talking a little trash about her today. I mean, we've been looking at some mistakes she made, but God still used Sarah. I am standing before you today banking on the fact that God can still use the United States of America and that God can still use me. I'm betting on it. But y'all, you and I have something that Sarah didn't have. We have her story. Sarah didn't have that. She's busy living it. She didn't have that testimony. And I wonder, did she even realize she was being harsh with Hagar? I don't know. Did she, did she know that Hagar even encountered God in the wilderness? I don't know. Did she hear about that? I don't know. But you and I did hear. And you and I do know. We saw Sarah's mistakes. We saw the divine encounters that she missed. And because of Sarah's witness, we can do better. Because of her story, we can see the urgency of reconciliation. That it's not just our relationships that are at stake, but our access to God. We do not have to pretend that Sarah was always right in order to give thanks to God for her story. Another interesting thing about Sarah is that in the end, her exploitation of Hagar didn't really work. I mean, remember, she, she uses Hagar. She wants Hagar to be her surrogate, to grow this baby and birth this baby for her. But that's not what God has in store for her, is it? In the end, she had to do it for herself. Friends, do not try to delegate the labor of wrestling with the topic of race. Do not outsource your opinions to the talking heads on TV and the echo chambers of social media. You will have to do this work yourself. You will have to face some brutal facts, not just about our history, but about our present. You could take a look at income inequality, the wealth gap, health care outcomes, education, employment, the criminal justice system. There's a lot of relevant places to begin if you're into research. But I have to point out to you as well that this is not just a head game. This is intensely personal, right? I mean, this kind of undertaking is not just going to have you reading articles on your phone. It's going to have you looking in the mirror sometimes. I went to um, Birmingham Southern College for my undergraduate study, and it's actually very close to where I now live and where I now pastor. It's not in West End, but it's kind of right down 
the road. And when I was there, when I first started, my very first year, I was given a very specific piece of advice. And if you've never been to Birmingham Southern, you gotta know that it is surrounded by a massive wrought iron gate, the whole campus. And there's one entrance and one exit, just one gate. And if, as you exit that gate, you turn left, you go to the interstate. And if, as you exit that gate, you turn right, you go to West End. I remember clearly as a freshman, I was instructed by an older student that no matter what I was trying to do, no matter where I was trying to go, I should never turn right out of campus, never. And I was this like eager little freshman, you know, I'm trying to like do what I'm supposed to do. And so I never did. I never did. I went all four years believing that the closest grocery store was the Walmart in Homewood. And I went all four years believing that the closest hospital in case of emergencies was UAB. I took someone there. I thought that was the closest one, but Princeton Baptist Medical Center is a straight shot, five minutes from campus, but only if you turn right. I missed out on so much while I was there because I didn't interrogate what I was told. I listened to what I was told and I missed out. I never questioned that fence around me and who it was keeping out and why. Sarah is my spiritual ancestor. Not because I'm repeating her story line by line, that's not how ancestry works, but because I'm living in the wake of her story. And if I don't look closely at her story, I will not know how to navigate these waters. If I don't listen to Sarah's story, I will never know that God is on the other side of every fence we build. I have never owned a slave, but I have ignored the racial disparities right in front of my face. I have assumed that that was someone else's problem, and it's not. On this day when we are thinking about freedom and justice for all, on this day when we are thinking about our history, I challenge you to just let that sink in a little differently this year. And I challenge you to, to just wonder, where is God calling you to reflect on racism? And what parts of your life is God calling you to interrogate? I think I'm gonna tell Robert that the story of Sarah is actually pretty good for the 4th of July. Happy fourth, y'all. Let's pray. God of Sarah, God of Hagar, in Christ you tell us that the truth will set us free. Give us the courage and wisdom to hear Sarah's witness, to see Hagar's suffering, and to face the truth of their testimony for us and for our nation today. Amen. <clears throat> if you did not already do so, there are communion elements at the back table, and I would invite you at this time, if you haven't already, to go and pick those up. We are celebrating Holy Communion today, which is, of course, another symbol of breaking down barriers and welcome and an open table. Um, if you have not used one of these before, this is your little Holy Communion snack pack, and you will in a moment be able to open up one side for the juice and one side for the wafer. But I want to tell you why we do this. We do this because on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he sat around a table with his friends and with somebody who would ultimately betray him. And he broke bread with all of them. He took the bread lifted it up to God, blessed it, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, all of y'all, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he did the same thing. He lifted it up, gave thanks to God, blessed it, passed it around and said, drink from this everybody. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you do these things, do them in remembrance of me. And so it is in remembrance of these mighty acts of God in Jesus Christ that we celebrate this holy meal together. Let's pray real quick. Oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we might be Christ's body for this world. So that everybody who might run into one of us later today would instead encounter you. Amen. Because there's one loaf, we, although we're many, are one body. Because we share in the one loaf. And because there's one cup, we, although we're many, are one body. Because we share in that one cup. At this time, you may receive the body and blood of Christ. This is the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us in the bread and the cup. Grant that as we depart from this place, we would do so in your spirit to love and serve our neighbors and to love and serve the world. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we'll continue to worship God by receiving tithes and offerings. You can do so either through the app on your phone or the box on the back table uh, just behind you. At this time, please stand as we worship God in song for our final song of worship. Sing, I could just sit. I could just sit. I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. Oh, 
falls down But you have called me higher You have called me deeper And I'll go where you will lead me You have called me higher You have called me deeper And I'll go where you will lead me Where you lead me I will be yours, oh, I will be yours for all my life. I will be yours, oh, I will be yours for all my life, so let your mercy. Caitlin for being here with us. It's such a pleasure. I mean, I only get one vote, but you can come back anytime. So, uh, yeah, let's pray together, um, or I'll send you on your benediction. Um, so receive this benediction. Remember, we we are the people of God. So let's go from here without any guilt, without any shame, without any fear, to be the people that God needs us to be, that our country needs, that our communities need. Let us be those people. Amen. Have an awesome week. We'll see you next time.